Okay, uh, the final speaker of this session, you can unshare your screen now. And the final speaker of the session today is Eric Norman from University of California, Berkeley, talking about stellar alchemy, the origin of the chemical elements. Good. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yep, yep, we can see it. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting for this opportunity to speak at this wonderful meeting. Um, I've changed the title a little bit from what the abstract said. I've enlarged it to include more than just a stellar uh, nucleosynthesis. And during the course of this meeting so far, there's been a number of talks on various aspects of nuclear astrophysics. Um, what I'm gonna to try to do is give a general overview of the entire field. So I apologize ahead of time to the experts. You're probably not gonna learn anything you don't already know. I geared this more for people who are interested in the field but not necessarily experts. And what I tried to do is show interesting new developments in the field. So a little bit of astro astronomy to start with. The first thing you notice when you go outside at night is that it's dark. Um, it turns out that's not a trivial observation. Uh, that problem has a long history. It's known as Olber's paradox. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to go look through the literature for this. You'll find that most of the answers in the astronomy textbooks are in fact wrong. But the next thing you notice beside the dark sky is there are these little dots of light in the sky, which turn out to be planets, stars, galaxies, and so on. And by studying the light from those objects, you can learn a lot about what the universe is made of. And the reason for that, as you all know, is that if you take white light and you send it through a prism, it breaks up into a continuous, continuous distribution of all the colors of the spectrum. On the other hand, if you have some hot gas and you pass the light from that through a prism, you don't see a continuum anymore. You see discrete lines, which are characteristic of the particular elements in that hot gas. And similarly, if you take white light and shine it on a cool gas and pass that through a prism, you end up seeing absorption features, again, characteristic of the materials in that cool gas. And in this way, we're able to look at the light from the stars and the galaxies and figure out their elemental composition. And what you find by doing that, and also by studying all the materials we can actually get our hands on on Earth, is the following, that of all the mass in the universe we can see, approximately 75% is the lightest chemical element, hydrogen. The next lightest element, helium, comprises about 23% of all the matter, and everything else represents about 2%. Now, I'm going to spend the first few minutes of the talk talking about the hydrogen and helium and where they came from, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about this 2%. And you might think, well, that's a really small fraction of all the matter in the universe. Who really cares? Except you have to realize that includes us and the Earth and all the things we can really care about and get our hands on. So it's a very important, although minor, 2%. So if you look more carefully at the uh, um, abundance distribution of matter that we can observe, you get a plot that looks like this. This is the log of the abundance as a function of the atomic weight of the species. And what you see is what I've already mentioned. Hydrogen and helium are by far and away the most abundant. There's a lack of lithium, beryllium, and boron. And then you see uh, things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen being fairly high in abundance. And in fact, these spikes that you can see are all alpha-like nuclei. That is, they're nuclei that um, are various integer combinations of alpha particles. And we'll see why that they have particularly large abundances later on. There's then a drop and then an abundance peak around mass 60. It's called the so-called iron peak. Then a gradual fall off punctuated by two doublets of uh, abundance peaks, one around mass 130 and 140, and another around mass 195 and 208. And we'll see how those arise in a little bit. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, we believe that our universe began about 14 billion years ago in an event called the Big Bang. There's very good observational evidence to support this idea, namely that the universe is expanding, furthermore that it is pervaded by a background of cosmic microwaves, and the light element abundances, that hydrogen, helium, the lithium, beryllium, and boron actually tell us a lot about the nature of the Big Bang. 
it turns out you can look at what would emerge from the Big Bang, that is roughly maybe a second or two after the initial event, you would be left with a soup containing neutrons, protons, electrons, photons, and neutrinos, and not much else. And this soup would then be expanding and cooling. And the question is, what kind of nuclear reactions might take place in that kind of environment? And the network that's been worked out is shown here. It's a very limited amount of nucleosynthesis that could occur. The reason for that is that there aren't any stable mass five or mass eight nuclei. And that prevents the nucleosynthesis from extending beyond this limited region. The first step would be uh, neutron and proton combining to make deuterium. Deuterium then could add either a neutron or a proton um, and eventually reach helium four. And once you get to the alpha particle, you can't add a neutron to that and you can't really combine two helium fours because mass eight is very short lived beryllium eight. So this is what we expect from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And if you go out and measure the abundances of the light elements, you get this plot from the particle data group. The yellow bars are the observed uh, abundances of various materials. So this is helium up here, deuterium is over here, lithium is here. We don't really have a measure of helium three. Um, but from these observations of the abundances, we can infer something about the neutron, or sorry, the baryon to photon ratio, which is a measure of how much matter there is in the universe. And this can be compared to the value that one obtains for this same ratio from the cosmic microwave background itself. And that's shown as this vertical band here. And what one can see is that there's a very narrow range of baryon to photon ratios, which provide agreement between the cosmic microwave background and the light element abundances. Very recently, there was a beautiful experiment done at the Gran Sasso lab in Italy by the Luna collaboration, which performed the most precise and most extensive measurement of one of the key reactions in Big Bang nucleosynthesis, namely the P gamma reaction on deuterium. This reaction destroys deuterium and eventually converts all the deuterium or almost all the deuterium into helium-4. Um, deuterium then provides a very sensitive measurement of the baryon density of the universe, because the more baryons there are, the less deuterium survives. This is their data. They were able to go to lower energies and with more precision than had been done before. And one learned some very interesting physics from these results, shown in this table and summarized here. Namely, the fact that very little deuterium survives allows you to infer this baryon to photon ratio and it implies the baryonic matter represents only a few percent of what we call the critical density, namely the amount of matter in the universe you would need to close it and stop that expansion. And the second thing is you can infer how many active neutrino species there are at the uh, time of nucleosynthesis. And in fact, there are only three of them, which is compatible with what we've seen experimentally on Earth. Namely, we have the electron, the mu, and the tau neutrino, and apparently there aren't any others. So moving on from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, if you study again the light coming to us from the stars, the astronomers put together this diagram called the Hertz von Russell diagram, where they plot the temperature of the stars, uh, they call it spectral class, and they do it in a funny way where high temperature is over here in the left-hand corner and you move to lower temperatures moving to the right, and then on the vertical axis, the luminosity or the brightness of the star. And what you find is that roughly 80% of all the stars in the universe fall in this roughly diagonal band called the main sequence. Our sun is here, it's a pretty ordinary star. Um, in the upper right hand corner, you see some very cool but very bright stars. These are called giant stars and we'll talk about those a little later. And then in the lower left hand corner, some very uh, dim but very hot stars. Uh, these are called white dwarfs and we'll see how they originate also. So a question that people have asked for a long time is what makes the stars shine? And this was figured out in the 1930s by Hans Bethe. He figured out that it was actually nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun and all the other stars. What's going on in our sun and most stars is the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Uh, schematically, four protons fuse together to make one helium-4 nucleus. Of course, in order to conserve electric charge, you need to emit two positrons in the process. And in order to conserve angular momentum, lepton number, and so on, two electron type neutrinos need to be emitted. And 25 MeV of energy is released in the process every time that happens. 
Of course, this doesn't happen in one step. It's actually a complicated set of reactions, beginning with a combination of two protons to make a deuterium, a positron, and a neutrino. And then this is the sequence of reaction in what's called the PP chain. And this is mainly what our sun is doing. Um, Beta also figured out that in more massive stars, in fact, there's a catalytic process that can happen known as the CNO cycle, where carbon-12 from the previous generation of stars can capture a proton, making nitrogen-13, which beta decays to carbon-13, captures another proton, making nitrogen-14, which captures another proton, making oxygen-15, which beta decays to nitrogen-15. And finally, the nitrogen-15 captures a proton, breaks apart into a helium-4, and so you've taken four protons and turned it into one helium-4, and you regenerate the carbon-12 to act as a catalyst for the next sequence. This is important in stars more massive than our sun, but in fact, it's actually going on in the sun as well. Um, how do you know that any of this is true? Well, you have to do observations, and unfortunately, you can't look into the center of the star or the sun uh, to see these reactions directly, um, but what you can do is detect neutrinos that are produced along the way, and John McCall here spent most of his career calculating for us the flux of neutrinos at the surface of the Earth as a function of their energy. And this is a plot from his work showing uh, the PP neutrinos, the ones from the CNO cycle, and the high energy boron-8 that are a small branch out of the, the PP chain. He would be very upset with me for showing this, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, that is, you can calculate the flux of solar neutrinos in two lines. You only need a few numbers. Uh, you need to know that 25 MeV of energy is created every single time the proton, four protons fuse to make a helium-4, and that all of the energy the sun produces is caused by that reaction. You need to know the luminosity of the sun at the surface of the Earth, and you can go outside and measure that on a sunny day, and it's about 1.2 kilowatts per square meter. And you also have to remember that there are two neutrinos created every time you make one helium-4 from those four protons. You put those things together and you calculate that the flux of neutrinos at the surface of the Earth should be about six times 10 to the 10th per square centimeter per second. They're going through you and me right now, whether you know it or not. And it doesn't matter whether it's day or night. And again, to know that this is in fact true and not just a theory, we have to do experiments. There have been a number of experiments over the years. Um, I talked last year at the TASE meeting about the SNOW experiment. There's also Super K, Boricino, and a number of others. What we learned, and I showed last year, is that the number of uh, neutrinos um, observed on Earth from the sun in most of the experiments that were done in the early times all showed fewer neutrinos than were expected. Um, the SNOW experiment resolved this discrepancy by showing that, in fact, all the neutrinos are there, but that by, time, by the time they reach the Earth, two-thirds of them have been converted into mu and tau neutrinos, and these other experiments weren't sensitive to anything but the electron type neutrinos. More recently, um, observations done by the Borixino collaboration have confirmed that in fact the PP neutrinos are there, and in fact with the flux that I mentioned earlier, uh, smaller branches of the PP chain are also seen, the so-called PEP neutrinos, beryllium-7, and very, very recently the first observation of the CNO neutrinos from our sun was observed by the Borixino collaboration. Uh, this represents a fairly small part of the ener energy production in our sun, but nevertheless confirms our overall understanding of what powers the sun, and now it's been confirmed by experiments. Um, in any star, what's going on is a fight between gravity, uh, which is trying to compress the star and contract it, and the radiation pressure being produced by the nuclear reactions happening in the core. So in our sun, this fight has been going on for about four and a half billion years. Um, it'll go on for another four or five billion years, at which point, essentially, all the hydrogen in the core will be converted into helium. And at that point, there's no longer any energy generation possible. So the core will begin to contract because of gravity. The density will go up. The temperature will go up. And at some point, the helium will ignite. It will start helium burning not in the chemical sense, but in the nuclear sense. And these folks over here, Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle, figured out in the 1950s that in fact, uh, it takes a very interesting set of nuclear reactions for this to actually work. And it goes back to the statement I made earlier, 
that broyamate uh, is a very short-lived species. It only lasts about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. And so when you combine two helium-4 to make a broyamate, um, you need to do something very quickly if you want to proceed any further. And what these folks realize is that under the conditions you would have in a star where the temperature is about 10 to the eighth Kelvin and the density is roughly 100,000 grams per cc, uh, you could in fact fuse three helium nuclei together and make a carbon-12 nucleus. However, to make the carbon-12 at a rate which is compatible with the amount we observe, they realized, Fred Hoyle in particular realized, that there had to be a resonance in this reaction. Otherwise, you wouldn't make enough carbon-12. And this is the so-called Hoyle state, which Tibor Kavedi gave an excellent talk on Monday about and published a recent paper in Fizzrev Letters on it. Um, back when Hoyle was doing his work, there was essentially nothing known about the structure of carbon-12. He actually predicted the existence of a state just above the threshold for beryllium-8 plus helium-4. Uh, and in particular, the state had to have spin-0 and positive parity so that it could serve as a resonance for this reaction at the low energies available in the star. Furthermore, it had to electromagnetically decay to the ground state of carbon-12 at least a small fraction of the time, so you'd end up producing a bit of carbon-12 in this reaction. There have been many measurements over the years of the radiated width or the probability for the state to decay to the ground state. And what Tibor has shown is that maybe there's some exciting new physics there. Uh, his result is substantially greater than the previous measurements, and it shows we still have a lot to learn about this particular reaction. And so hopefully there'll be new experiments done to elucidate this, this problem. Um, once you've made carbon-12, you can add another alpha particle and make O16. Again, there's some interesting physics here. In this case, the states that are available in the oxygen-16 nucleus, uh, it turns out it's actually a sub-threshold state that plays a major role. That is, the mass of carbon-12 plus an alpha is a bit above the energy of the excited state that would provide a way for this reaction to proceed at a reasonable rate. Uh, this has again been studied many times experimentally. It's a very, very difficult experiment. and We still don't know with a high enough precision the rate for this reaction. So this is another area of active research. Um, there's a very good nuclear physics textbook that I've used to teach graduate students the basics of nuclear physics. And they have a very nice section on nuclear astrophysics. This is by Bastavant et al. And this diagram from their book illustrates a very interesting uh, set of nuclear levels. In fact, what Bastavant and company argue is that the only arrangement of nuclear levels that allows sufficient carbon-12 to be produced for us to be here uh, is in fact the one that has occurred in nature. Namely that uh, beryllium-8 is a little bit heavier than two alpha particles. The Hoyle state is a little higher in energy than three alpha particles. And the one minus level in O16 is a little lower in energy than carbon plus an alpha. You can say this is a coincidence. You can say this is a divine intervention. I'll uh, leave it up to you to decide. But if things had been a little bit different in terms of where these levels were or their nuclear properties, we would not be here. So you can ask what happens after all the helium in the core of the star has been burned into carbon and oxygen. And at this point, there's a dividing line in the evolution of stars. For stars lower than about 10 times the mass of our sun, no further energy generation is possible. The core never gets hot enough to burn carbon or oxygen. These stars then gradually cool down and uh, contract. Uh, they become what are called white dwarf stars, those ones in the lower left-hand corner of that Hertzsprung russell diagram. Uh, they're being supported by electron degeneracy pressure because the density is so high. It turns out there's an upper limit to the amount of material that can be supported in this way. It's known as the Chandrasekhar mass limit after Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who figured this all out in the 1930s. Uh, the upper limit is about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. So eventually we believe this is what will happen to our sun. However, for more massive stars, they are not able to settle down in this quiet way something much more catastrophic is going to happen, and eventually they will become neutron stars or black holes. For these massive stars, uh, the core contracts, the carbon can begin burning through carbon-12 plus carbon-12, making things like magnesium-24, neon-20, sodium-23, and so on. The oxygen can burn, making things like sulfur-32 and silicon-28. Um, beyond that, the fusions don't happen by 
things like magnesium 24 plus magnesium 24 or sulfur plus sulfur, simply because the Coulomb barriers are too high, the temperature in the star never gets hot enough to allow those kinds of reactions to happen. Instead, you get a sequence of alpha particle captures. So you would do silicon 28 plus an alpha to make sulfur 32, sulfur 32 plus alpha to make argon 36, and so on. And you work your way all the way up from silicon 28 up to nickel 56. And what's happening there is you're working your way, in this case down, uh, the binding energy curve. You're probably used to seeing this uh, curve inverted, but I've drawn it this way to illustrate that you're getting to more and more tightly bound nuclei as you fuse hydrogen to helium, then helium to carbon and oxygen and so on, and you get to the most tightly bound nuclei at iron. And what that means is once you've done that, no further energy generation is possible in the star because it costs you energy to fuse iron nuclei together. You don't gain energy. So once the star has reached this point, it's basically on its deathbed. Something very catastrophic is about to happen because nothing can stop gravity from causing the core of the star to collapse. If you could look inside a massive star just before its death, this is what we believe you would see. This is a cartoon of a roughly 25 solar mass star. Uh, the outer surface is basically unchanged from its initial composition because the temperature never got high enough for any nuclear reactions to happen. As you move inwards, the temperature was higher and higher and the density was higher and higher. So more and more uh, reactions were possible until you get down to the core. And this is what we believe would happen for such a massive star. It would spend about 7 million years burning hydrogen into helium in its core, as opposed to the 10 billion years that our sun will do it. It would then spend about half a million years burning helium, uh, 600 years burning carbon, a year burning neon, eventually going from silicon up to nickel in a day, at which point um, no further energy generation is possible. Gravity takes over, the core of the star collapses and goes all the way down to nuclear density. Uh, nuclei are very uh, incompressible. And so the rest of the star, which is also falling inwards, eventually bounces off that core, rebounds and uh, explodes the star and in the period of a few seconds, dismantles the entire star in what's known as a supernova explosion. We've actually seen these events many times over the centuries. This is one that happened in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a companion galaxy to our own. This star turned into this in a period of a few seconds. Uh, this was as bright as an entire galaxy for a short period of time, visible to the naked eye. Um, and as impressive as that is, what you see in the optical spectrum represents only 1% of the total energy of the supernova. The other 99% is carried away by neutrinos that are created in the collapse when the density gets so high that electrons get driven into protons, converting them into neutrons and neutrinos, and also pair production, uh, electron-positron pair production and annihilation can produce neutrinos as well. And 99% of the energy of the supernova is carried away by neutrinos. And again, I showed this uh, plot last year from one of the two uh, neutrino detectors on Earth that were operating when supernova 87 went off. Uh, these are neutrino events that were observed in the Cameo Conde detector, roughly 10 events that were seen in a very short period of time. Nothing like this has ever been seen before or since. Uh, and I would point out that these 10 events showed up in a period of a few seconds after having traveled 460,000 years to reach us from uh, the Magellanic Cloud. Uh, and the fact that they arrived in such a small time interval allows you to place very tight constraints on the possible mass of the neutrino, essentially as good as the laboratory measurements that have been done. Um, you're probably sick of hearing about neutrinos, and I promise I won't talk any more about them in this particular presentation. We have other signatures that show us that the sequence of nuclear reactions actually does take place uh, in stars. And in particular from 1987A, uh, there were gamma ray obs obser obser observatories in space. And when they pointed to the supernova, they saw this line at 847 keV, which is characteristic of the decay of cobalt 56. Remember I said that the alpha particle sequence would build you up to nickel 56, the daughter of nickel 56 is cobalt 56. It has a 77-day half-life. When it decays, you get this 
847 keV gamma ray, which we've studied extensively in the laboratory. And lo and behold, you see it coming from supernova 87A, confirming that the sequence of reactions actually took place there. That particular supernova isn't the only one where we've seen evidence of recent nucleosynthesis. There was a supernova in the constellation Cassiopeia, uh, called Cassiopeia A, that took place in the 1600s. This again was visible to the naked eye for a short period of time. It's still visible with a telescope. And in fact, this image is taken with a gamma ray telescope. And these bright spots are actually a gamma ray produced by the decay of titanium 44. It's an 1157 keV gamma ray, again, which we can study in the laboratory. Titanium has a half-life of about 62 years. And even though the supernova occurred over 300 years ago, that's not very many half-lives. And so you can still see live titanium-44 coming from this supernova remnant. And again, titanium-44 is one of these alpha particle nuclei made in that sequence of reactions, building up from silicon to nickel-56. Another bit of evidence for this nucleosynthesis comes from another area namely studying meteorites and looking very carefully at inclusions in these meteorites. This is a so-called Murchison meteorite, which fell in Australia a number of years ago. Within it, there are some very small graphite grains. Uh, these are, were formed before the solar system actually formed. Uh, and inside the grains, in some of them, you see these little tiny inclusions, which are actually titanium carbide. And so Ernst Zinner and his collaborators at Washington University have looked at the isotopic composition of the elements inside these little tiny inclusions. And what you find is here we have the uh, abundance of calcium 44 compared to calcium 40 inside these grains. And in a few of them, what you see is large excesses of calcium 44. Um, and you might wonder, what does that have to do with nucleosynthesis? It turns out these are titanium carbide grains. And so it's believed that what you're seeing today is calcium 44 was actually incorporated into the grain as live titanium 44 and decayed in situ to give you the calcium 44 excess you see today. So this is sort of proven that this nucleosynthesis chain actually occurs in, in supernovae. Um, the question is what happens after the supernova? You're left behind with perhaps a core if the entire star isn't uh, expelled. And there are two possible outcomes here again, depending upon the mass of the remnant. Um, if the remnant, um, the, I should say, the remnant is very neutron rich. Remember, the electrons were driven into the protons, making lots of neutrons. So in fact, you have a ball of neutrons sitting there. Um, and it can form what we call a neutron star, which is supported now by the degenerate neutron pressure, analogous to the degenerate electron pressure in white dwarfs. Again, there's an upper limit to the amount of matter that can be supported in this way. It's known as the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, and it turns out to be about two and a half times the mass of our sun. There have been a bunch of neutron star masses determined, and none of them are larger than this. If, in fact, uh, the mass of the remnant is greater than this, nothing can support it. It will form a black hole. And a black hole is an object that is so massive and so small in size that nothing, including light, can escape from it. There's a radius known as the Schwarzschild radius. And for our sun, that radius turns out to be three kilometers. So in fact, if our sun collapsed down to three kilometers, it would be a black hole. We don't believe that will happen. But massive stars, in fact, uh, will, will do that. Now, I spent all this time talking about nucleosynthesis up to and including iron. But we know that there are elements beyond iron. And the question is, where did they come from? And the answer, again, was provided by Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle back in the 50s. Uh, they realized that charged particle reactions can't do it, that, in fact, you would need to rely on neutron capture reactions and beta decay. And in fact, they realized that you need two different kinds of neutron capture processes, one called the slow neutron capture process, one called the rapid neutron capture process. And you may ask, rapid or slow compared to what? And the answer is compared to beta decay, because very often when you add a neutron to a nucleus, you something, make something beta unstable. In the S process, you almost always have time for the beta decay to happen before the next neutron comes along. In the rapid process, you do many, many neutron captures before beta decay. The S process produces about half the nuclei between 
iron and bismuth, and we believe it occurs during helium burning in red giant stars. The rapid process produces the other half and all the uranium and thorium in the universe. And it may in fact occur in supernova, but I'll show you some evidence that it may in fact also occur or maybe primarily occurs in neutron star mergers. Just to explain a little bit about the details of both the S and R process, this is a portion of the chart of the nuclides. Imagine you start at iodine-127 and you add a neutron, you make something beta unstable in the S process, it beta decays, you get to xenon, you work your way through the xenon isotopes until you get to something beta unstable, again, beta decay. And what you can see in the S process is you work your way through the stable nuclei never venturing more than one neutron away from stability before beta decay brings you back. You can see that you make a lot of nuclei that way, but there are a number of them you don't reach in the S process, in particular, these neutron-rich nuclei over here, uh, you don't make in the S process because there's a beta unstable one with a short half-life in between. These are made only in the R process where the neutron density is so high, you make very, very neutron-rich nuclei for a short period of time, and once the neutron source turns off, they beta decay back, and the beta decays terminate at the first stable nucleus they run into. Uh, the nuclei in blue are made only in the R process. The ones in red are made only in the S process because they are shielded by these stable R process nuclei. And the ones shown in white are made in both S and R. And the ones shown in yellow aren't reached in any of these processes. They are made in what's called the P process, which involves things like proton gamma, P gamma reactions, uh, gamma N reactions, and so on. The S process, as I said, occurs uh, in helium burning zones in red giant stars. The neutrons are produced by reactions like C13 alpha N or neon 22 alpha N under temperatures around one to four times 10 to the eighth Kelvin and neutron densities on the order of 10 to the eighth per cubic centimeter. Under such conditions, you can calculate roughly the rate of neutron captures in the S process. It's the neutron number density times the average value of the capture cross section times the neutron velocity. Putting in these numbers, uh, 10 to the eighth neutrons per cc, roughly 10 millibar neutron capture cross section, and a velocity of about two times 10 to the eighth uh, centimeters per second for the neutron. You get a capture rate on the order of two times 10 to the minus nine per second which corresponds to a time between successive neutron captures on the order of 15 years in the S process. Ample time for most beta decays to occur before the next neutron comes along. So in the S process, you can then calculate roughly what you expect for the abundance distribution. Imagine you have a set of isotopes of a given element and look at this one with uh, mass A. Uh, it is being produced by neutron captures on the isotope with one fewer neutron that's being destroyed by neutron capture on itself. So the rate of change of the abundance of species A is proportional to the capture cross-section of A minus one times the abundance of A minus one. That's the production reaction. And it's being destroyed by neutron capture on itself. And that's proportional to the capture cross-section on A times its abundance. Now, if you get in the situation of equilibrium, that means you're creating this isotope as fast as it's being destroyed. So its abundance doesn't change with time. And what that means is that sigma A minus one times N of A minus one should equal sigma A and A, and it should be a constant. And lo and behold, if you look at the capture cross-section times abundance for many nuclei that have been measured by Franz Kepler and others and his collaborators, what you see is that in between neutron magic numbers, this product is roughly constant. So you see being roughly constant here and again here, as we expect from that simple uh, derivation. What you do expect to find are abundance peaks wherever you run into a neutron magic number because those nuclei, sorry, will have small capture cross sections and therefore you'll tend to build up abundance peaks there. And these abundance peaks will happen for neutron magic number 50, 82, 126, and they will correspond to abundance peaks in mass at around mass 90, 140, and 208. And those are the higher mass members of those doublets I showed you early on. The S process terminates at bismuth 209 because when you add a neutron to bismuth 209, you make bismuth 2010, which either beta decays to polonium 210 and then an alpha decay, or it alpha decays directly and then beta decay. So you cycle back to um, mass 206. 
And what that means is that in order to explain things like uranium and thorium, you need the rapid neutron capture process, the R process. Um, so here's a calculation I did 100 years ago. Um, here's the S process over here falling through the line of beta stability. Under very uh, extreme temperature and neutron density conditions, you get this path for the R process passing through extremely neutron rich nuclei far from stability. Um, you end up again building up abundance peaks when you run into neutron magic numbers. And once the neutron source turns off, whatever the source is, these nuclei beta decay back, again giving you abundance peaks, but now at a lower mass number because you run into the neutron magic numbers at a lower Z in the R process than you do in the S process. And so you end up with peaks at mass 130 and 195 from the R process versus mass 140 and 208 for the S process. And in this process, you bypass the bottleneck at bismuth, and so you can make all the uranium and thorium. For many years, we thought that supernova were the only possible source of R process nuclei. But very recently, thanks to the measurements of gravitational waves, another potential source has emerged. And that is the um, uh, spiraling in of neutron star binaries and that fusion of neutron star binaries to make either a heavier neutron star or a black hole has provided evidence for another uh, R process site. So this is the LIGO uh, gravitational wave array. Uh, one of their sites, this is the one in, uh, in Washington state, two very large laser interferometers. These are four kilometers in each arm. And what they observed for the very first time in 2017 was the merger of two neutron stars. So these are neutron stars that were bound gravitationally and over time they spiraled inwards and eventually combined into one heavier object, either a black hole or a more massive neutron star. These plots, which are very, very little difficult to see, are the frequencies of the gravitational waves detected by these detectors over a period of a few seconds. This is their a site in Washington State. They had another one in Louisiana, and both ob observatories saw the gravitational waves separated by a fraction of a second due to the transit time for the waves to go from uh, Louisiana to Washington State. Uh, once this observation of gravitational waves was made, um, it was a major event because gravity waves had been predicted by Einstein a uh, hundred years ago, and people had tried very hard over the years to observe them. This was the very first time they were observed, and in fact, led to the Nobel Prize in physics for that observation. Once these were reported, uh, very quickly, the astronomers pointed their telescopes uh, toward the remnant, and what they observed in the optical range were these spectra uh, shown in black. Uh, these are the spectra as a function of wavelength. Over a period of a week or so following the merger of the two neutron stars, and What's being plotted in the various colors are the compositions of material ejected from the neutron star merger, um, assuming different um, nucleosynthetic histories. So the blue curves are ones which contain very little in the way of R process material. The green contains a mixture of R process and non R process material. And the orange or red, orange rather, are shown uh, very new neutron rich R process ejecta. And the combination of them tend to agree quite well with what was observed, indicating that the ejecta from this particular neutron star merger contained a lot of lanthanide elements, which are indicative of an R process. And so this provides fairly strong evidence that in fact, neutron star mergers are at least one potential site for this rapid neutron capture process. I would like to point out there's some evidence to the contrary, at least supporting the idea that this may not be the only site of R process nucleosynthesis. And that comes from observations of spectra obtained from very metal poor stars. These are stars that formed very early in the history of our universe. So there was very little time for previous generations of stars to produce heavy elements, eject them, and then have them incorporated into another generation of star. So this particular star has an abundance of iron compared to hydrogen compared to that of our solar system, about a thousand times lower. So this is very um, old star. And nevertheless, if you look at the light coming to us from it, 
you can observe a pattern of abundances that looks remarkably like an R process distribution um, all the way up to uranium and thorium. And these observations of the uranium and thorium allow you to actually determine the age of this star because the green curve is the R process path. And for a young star, uranium would be sitting here just a little bit below thorium. In fact, uranium is way down here indicating that this star is extremely old and most of the uranium has actually decayed because the uranium has a four and a half billion year half-life, whereas the thorium has a 12 billion year half-life. And so this ratio of the two allows you to determine the age of the star and it's 14 billion years, which means this is a firm lower limit to the age of our universe. And furthermore, this is so old, it's hard to believe that there was enough time before this star formed for generations of stars to go through all their nucleosynthesis, produce a neutron star binary, which then merged with another neutron star and ejected material. So the bottom line from all of this is there's probably more than one site for the R process. Perhaps it's a combination of supernovae and uh, neutron star mergers. So I've worked my way all the way up from hydrogen to uranium in the course of this talk. What I hope I've done is convince you that nuclear reactions are responsible for the origin of all the chemical elements in our universe. And that in fact, what makes the star shine are nuclear reactions. And we have firm observations, both from the laboratory and from astronomical observations, that in fact, this is all true. I'm gonna stop here and be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Eric, for a wonderful talk. Um, I believe our chairman, Nico, has a question. Would you like to answer, ask your question, Nico? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Eric, for such a beautiful talk, like, like always you do. Uh, <laughs> You're I'd very like kind. Ask, no, 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 you are, you are really well, a, real, a real star. So uh, I wanted to ask, we, we have a discussion the other day about neutron star mergers having you know, there's a nature paper where they claim that they have uh, 800 billion Kelvin, which corresponds to a temperature of 69 uh, MeV. If this is the case, uh, we discussed that this is not possible that these guys could be nurseries of elements. I mean, most of the, of the nuclei will be, will be almost evaporated. You will have only proton and neutrons, and, and then you, will, you wouldn't have the the, the the material, the original material to create the R process, no? I agree with you. Um, at such high temperatures, you photo disintegrate the nuclei. Right. The, only the only way that this could happen is in the ejecta, while it's cooling off, those neutrons and protons would recombine. Whether then, in fact that can... Go ahead. But then uh, it, won't, it wouldn't be an, an R process as we, we imagine, right? Because... The R process is based on, on, on not having neutrons and protons uh, flying around in the, in, the, in the ejectile. Well, it's not the standard R process, that's for sure. Uh, but in fact, you know, in the crust of the neutron star before the merger actually happens, you do have a limited region where it's not just neutrons. There are actually heavy nuclei there. And so I think the idea is if you could eject some of that material from the crust along with the neutrons and protons, you could actually do neutron capture on things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, and maybe work your way all the way up in an R process. But then that and, would imply that you are creating more light elements at the beginning. Exactly, exactly. And in the old days, we actually thought that might happen in a supernova because right. one thought was that in the collapse of the core of the supernova, you would break down the iron into alpha particles and neutrons, right? And if that was ejected, the alpha particles and the neutrons could recombine in such a way you might actually generate an R process. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was part of my thesis in 1978, uh, where we I thought saw. that might actually happen. And under I certain extreme conditions, it could happen. Mm -hmm. And also, also the evidence for having uh, elements that uh, you know in the heavy elements, there's no absorption lines there uh, in the in the in the spectra you show. There's no no absorption lines typical of of uh, you know what you can identify on top of the on top of the black body radiation. You mean even this spectra? Uh, that's right. Yeah. No, they didn't see any lines at all, and this is one of the reasons I have to say I'm a bit of a skeptic. Okay. Right. What they're saying is that um, these lanthanides tend to redden the spectrum 
much more than many other elements would. But there's no firm identification that in fact these are lanthanides or that there actually are processes. So I have to say I'm a skeptic on this, but certain people but that, who've that done depends, this- It depends on the temperature, depend, depends on the blanketing effect, depends on, depends on so many things, depends on the Balmer jump. I mean, there are many issues there that, the, the, that we don't know. I agree with you entirely. I was just trying to report, you know, what has recently yeah. happened in the field. And, you know, this could be true, but it'll take further observations to confirm it. Of course. Thank you so much. Okay. I believe Alfredo uh, has a question. Uh, Go ahead, Alfredo. Hi, hi. Well, thank you for a very nice talk. I, I wanted yet to know your opinion about this uh, quote, quote, prediction by, let's say, astrophysicists and nuclear physicists uh, in, uh, let's say, in, uh, in 2010, where they have the, the light curve. What is your, your opinion uh, on, on this, let's say, prediction? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand your question. You mean, uh, hi. No, my que no, it's just your opinion. Right. So you haven't mentioned that there was a prediction of the light curve made in the monthly notices of the Royal Society by this fellow in America and uh, Martinez Pinedo, that they have a light curve that really, really uh, falls into the experimental data. And I was a bit, you know. The light curve from what, Alfredo? This was a theoretical prediction. Right, but I mean, from what, from an astro what astronomical event? For this merger. This was oh, for the mergers. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not really familiar with that particular prediction. I'm no. just, just aware of uh, this nature paper. Sorry. Okay, no, no, because it's, uh, well, it was in 2010. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and this is... Uh, Whatever it is, it's, uh, it was seven years before. <laughs> and right. This is, uh, this is uh, something. Well, I should say that um, the idea that neutron star mergers might be a source of our process material is not a new one. Uh, yeah. Schramm, Schramm and company talked about this in the 1970s, but there was no astronomical data to support the idea. So it kind of fell by the wayside. Okay. Thanks for a very nice talk. You're welcome. We have one final question from Marcus. Would you like to ask your question, Marcus? If not, I can... Oh, here we go. You can unmute yourself. Okay, if trans-led elements are produced in, in a merger, shouldn't we now not uh, now by not now the 2614 lead line appear in the gamma spectrum? Again, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. Well, it says that the trans elements are produced. Shouldn't yes. we by now be able to see the 2614 lead line appear in the gamma spectrum? From the, from, the neutron, from the neutron star merger, no, we don't see any lines of any kind. We don't see right. optical lines. We certainly don't see uh, nuclear gamma rays. This object is far too far away for us ever to hope to see those. Well, there's only estrontium lines. A little bit, they, they, they claim that there are some estrontium lines. There's a blue shift. Um, you saw in my, in my presentation the first day that there's a nature paper where they, there's a, a little bit of a dent on where the estrontium two lines should be. And if you have a, a, a blue shift. Right, but this question had to do with nuclear gamma rays, I thought. Right, you were talking about the 2614 line for yeah. lead. Yeah. Right. But in, and, in a merger, I mean, I mean, in a merger, you see transient lines, uh, absorption lines, supposedly, and that's the only lines that we have. Right, but my point is that this object where the neutron stars merge is so far away, there's no right. hope of seeing nuclear gamma rays. <laughs> we don't have okay. detectors that are sensitive enough and we oh, probably course, never will. Uh, of course, right. of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, um, Nico, you're gonna have to decide. There's one more question or do you wanna cut this off? Uh, more question, one more question. Let's, let's okay. enjoy it. Okay, Vivek has a question. 
Vivek Tatar. I can read. I can say it. Or you will read it out. Depends. Go ahead. You say it. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, is one to understand, therefore, that the production of heavy elements like uranium two thirty eight is still not very well understood. I would say we understand the nuclear process. It's certainly the R process is responsible for it. The the details still need to be worked out. And in particular, where the astronomical site is, I would say is still not known for sure. Um, no, that's right. that, that was the... And, and the, by details, I mean experimental nuclear details are needed to do precise calculations of the abundance pattern. In particular, we need to know things like the masses of those very neutron rich nuclei, their beta decay half lives, things like beta delay neutron emission probabilities and so on to predict accurately the distribution of abundances you expect to see. So there's lots more work to be done in the future uh, to understand the R process. But the basic uh, another, idea- Yeah, another short question. Uh, what is the likelihood of a neutron star merger in a zone or at a distance where we would actually be able to make measurements of, let's say the uh, gamma rays from such processes? Uh, I think it's very unlikely. Um, I'm not a good enough astronomer to tell you where the closest neutron star binary is, but I suspect it's very, very far away. And the only objects from which we've been able to see nuclear gamma rays are things within our own galaxy. Supernova 87A, you know, is very close by. Uh, Cassiopeia A is within our galaxy. We right. haven't seen any nuclear gamma rays from anything outside our galaxy yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric, for again, for a great talk. And let's thank all the speakers in this session. You're welcome.